welcome to Money Matters TV and our segment called Growth Stories, where we hear from entrepreneurs and advisors who share secrets and advice on what business owners need to know to grow. My name is Mike Verrill. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Development with Sharp Financial Group. We are an integrated financial management firm that has combined a unique process of accounting and tax, wealth management, business advisory, uh, family office services, and capital solutions to help business owners and their families achieve extraordinary things. From time to time, financial issues involving healthcare, life sciences, or technology uh, discussions may be uh, shared on this show. Those discussions are not, should not be viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since the show is pre recorded and showed at a later date, some of those discussions may no longer be relevant. You should always seek advice from your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. I'm joined today by my co-host, Rhea Bears. Rhea is a vice president with CBRE, a global real estate consulting firm. Rhea heads up the media and technology practices in Philadelphia, where she helps high growth companies achieve uh, business objectives through their real estate strategy. Rhea also serves on the program and outreach committees for Tech Girls, an organization that helps expose middle school age girls to careers in technology. Hello, Rhea. Thanks for joining me for Growth Stories. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Rhea, we are. Well, it's it's good to see you again. Um, yes. We are in unprecedented times in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, if you will. COVID nineteen has uh, swept the world and caused um, a complete uh, reversal in how we normally do business. Obviously, I think a big impact for that will be the real estate industry. Most people are working from home. Many retail locations are closed or only act, people are only accessing through curbside pickup. What, what are some of the discussions locally here, nationally, globally, that CBRE is having around what this might look like long term? Sure. And I'm, I'm just going to address that from the office perspective, um, where we are you know, very much focused on reentry right now and what that looks like. So from the long term um, re-entry situation, I think we're going to see a lot of things and trends that are coming up. I think we're going to see a lot more flexibility in the workforce. Um, we have been doing that from home here in the Philadelphia area for nine weeks. I think you're also going to see a huge focus on wellness and safety um, from the perspective of HVAC, flushing out buildings and making sure that there's new air um, janitorial specifications. And, and then the other thing is, I think we will see a little bit of a reverse from the densification trend, but it may not be as expected. It may not be just taking double the space to be able to fit six feet apart. It may be more from a staggered wor workforce perspective um, and giving people more flexibility when they re-enter. Um, so much of this re-entry is going to be about personal responsibility and behavior modification. So that's some of the stuff we're talking about right now. Interesting. So I've heard some conversations about, you know, everybody has moved to this open work plan. Mm -hmm. Have you evaluated that? Are companies talking to you about re-engineering their space so it's there is more confined workspace for individuals? Um, not confined because I think so much of it has to do with the air exchange and bringing more fresh air into the building. But we have talked about potentially doing every other workstation or bench so that you do have six feet apart between folks. Um, and then safe areas that um, have much more janitorial. For example, a conference room could be rededicated as a safe area so that someone that needs to come into the office um, for some reason will do so, but they will go in right after it's been sanitized and cleaned, and then that conference room will be red until it can be re-sanitized and re-cleaned. So we're talking about things like that as well, but I don't think we're going to see a pushback to offices um, because of companies' you know, economic components. I think they're just gonna be focused on how to make the workplaces safe for employees to come in and that flexibility. Interesting. So we'll we'll see how that develops. We will. Right in the midst of it now. So um, Rhea, we have a, an exciting guest today. Uh, someone I've known for a long time, a serial entrepreneur, 
He started businesses, sold businesses, um, raised money from venture capital and helped other entrepreneurs uh, mm -hmm. start and grow successful businesses. But before we introduce our guest, we have a question from one of our okay. viewers. Uh, Ralph Thomas from Philadelphia would like to know, and this kind of goes to the conversation we were just having, mm -hmm. how is the real estate uh, area doing after the downturn? And I think we can uh, qualify that statement by saying that we don't have crystal balls mm -hmm. and we're pretty much still very much in the downturn. Um, we haven't and won't see for a while an economic recovery, I don't believe. But what are some of the economic impact of the commercial real estate market specifically in Philadelphia right now for Ralph? Sure. And, and that is a great question. And you're right. We don't have crystal balls right now. Um, I wish we did. Um, retail, as you can imagine, is really, really suffering greatly right now. Um, when it comes to Philadelphia, the one good thing that we do have going for us is that because of our basis in industries, with healthcare and um, universities and higher education, we do have a more balanced reaction. So we always like to say we don't go as low and we don't go as high as other cities of, of life size. So I, I think we're going to see a bit of that, but um, it is really industry to industry. Some of our manufacturing clients are suffering greatly as well. Um, and so we're trying to support them any way we can, but um the interesting thing here, Mike, is that this began right at the end of the first quarter or really in the midst of the first quarter. So the statistical facts to point at aren't there yet because the first quarter, of course, was poised to be one of the best since 2014. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. We're seeing that with, you know, from a financial standpoint, one of our clients, when we close out the quarter, it's not too bad, but right. it's going to be the second, third and potentially the fourth quarter numbers that are really impactful and really tell the That's story. Right. I think. That's right. It's always great to hear from our viewers uh, to submit mm -hmm. for a future show. Here's how to send your questions to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com whether building businesses or selling them investing in a turnaround situation raising venture capital or helping entrepreneurs um, start companies and expand on new ideas uh, this serial entrepreneur has seen all sides and ups and downs as it meet what it, what it means to be an entrepreneur so please to welcome the growth stories david nowhere executive in residence at the university of utah david thanks for joining Rhea and me for our uh, segment growth stories today i uh, appreciate it thanks mike thanks Rhea. glad to be here that's great so live from park yeah. city um there are some benefits to remote taping i don't know we would have maybe flown you in david <laughs> Um, so Mike just listed a great number of experiences that you've had. Um, tell us how your entrepreneurial journey began. Well, I, I think I have to give all the credit to Hagen dazs of all the things. <laughs> um, when I was in high school, I got a job at Hagen dazs um, and I went in for my first day and they were teaching me how to scoop and how to do everything in about um, 90 minutes into my first day, the owner came in and got in an argument with the manager about whether the manager had authority to hire me or not. And uh, apparently he did not have authority. So they fired me. They opened up the till. I think the minimum wage was like $3 or something like that. So they gave me $4 and 50 cents straight out in cash and sent me home. And um, I'm like, well, this is no good at all. So the next day I, um, I worked with one of my buddies from high school and we created a window washing company and we started working for ourselves. And uh, that's where the bug set, to be honest. We learned that we could, um, we could control our own destiny. I wasn't gonna get fired because two other people got in a fight. 
Um, and we built a great little company, um, sent ourselves to Europe, bought cars with the proceeds. And um, in, that was the beginning of upper crust window washing in Dallas, Texas, <laughs> all places. So Hagen Dazs gets full credit. <laughs> That's great. We'll, we'll, do, we'll clean windows. I did. I would clean windows. There's no competition in that space. It was a good space. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. Do you think, um, you know, when you talk about other entrepreneurs and similar experiences, I mean, are entrepreneurs made or are they born? Is that, where, where does that bug kind of start? Well, um, I teach at the business school at the University of Utah and um, help shepherd the spinouts from the U, some of which are managed by faculty members. And um, most of the tools that you need to be a good entrepreneur can be taught. I mean, it's it, honestly a physics professor who's trying to become a new CEO already knows physics, and that's way harder than being a business person. Um, so you can teach them the stuff that they need to know, but they have to have a tolerance for ambiguity and they can't fall into the trap of loving their own product and service too much. They have to test to make sure that other people think the same way that they do. So I believe it can be taught. Some people are further up that learning curve to begin with than others. But uh, I mean, I've t been teaching it for years now and I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the tools are something that's transferable. So what well, other... Yeah, it is. And what other characteristics, you've named two, would you say that um, founders need to have? <laughs> um, well, first of all, they have to be resilient, absolutely resilient, because someday you go into work every day and you're excited. Some days you go home and you're pretty beat up because it's hard being an entrepreneur. But you have to be able to get up the next day and, and go and go fight again. and. Um, and keep plugging away. Further, you have to be able to pivot. Um, when you're wrong about something, which happens all the time, mm -hmm. you darn well be, better be able to, to recognize it and figure out how to take the next step so that you continue to move forward. Because mm -hmm. um, being an entrepreneur is to a great extent about being wrong all the time, but <laughs> fixing your mistakes super fast. Um, if you keep fixing your mistakes and moving forward, then you're gonna be okay. Um, so you have to be able to pivot. And uh, and like I'm saying, you, you better expect that you're going to make errors. But don't let them kill your company. Don't be so stubborn so that uh, you can't change things fast enough to, to be um, responsive to what the market's actually telling you. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point, David, because, you know, what you hear people say is some of the keys to entrepreneur have be passionate in what you, what you do and believe in and, and you know, push away the naysayers. So is that something that you work on from a, a learning standpoint is how do you divide yourself between overly passionate and being able to pivot and admit that you, you know, the direction you're headed is not the right direction. Is that, I mean, you have classes that teach that, like how do you, or is that just trial and error? Um, well, there's a good bit of trial and error involved. I can't tell you how many times we've, initiated projects that just failed, failed miserably. And the objective is to fail fast, figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. And uh, like a good gardener, you add fertilizer to the stuff that's growing well and you prune the stuff that's not and just keep doing that over and over and over again. And it, uh, over time, you, your first idea about what you think your company is going to be is rarely what it ends up being. Okay, because you have to pivot and you know polish all the time, and I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made over the years. Um, but I've been lucky enough not to let any of those mistakes kill the company. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to to keep moving forward, figure out what works and what doesn't, and and just work go with what works. And there's great examples of that in almost any startup. Um, and honestly, if you talk to an entrepreneur. Very rarely is there an original business idea what actually worked. But the good ones are keen enough to listen to the market and listen to their colleagues and listen to their investors and listen to their, their inner voice and figure out how to adjust on the fly so that they end up um, building something that's, that's sustainable and valuable. 
So I think that's that's a good point to couple that passion and is listening and constantly evaluating customers in the market and whether what you're offering product or service is connecting with what the actual market needs are. Oh my gosh, we have so, so many stories about people telling us that we're wrong. And um, <laughs> frequently, you get I get stubborn and I just say, no, no, they're wrong. But if you let it distill a little bit, if somebody you respect and is who's smart is telling you you're wrong, you better listen really carefully because you may in fact be wrong and have to make an adjustment to, uh, to reflect that. I remember the first time I went for VC funding for our, my very first venture backed company. And um, the VC had me and my, my co-founder back on the sidewalk in like 11 minutes. It was just humbling, absolutely humbling. Told us the whole thing was unfundable, that we were grossly exceeding our capabilities. And it took us two or three weeks to figure out that the guy was right. And so we adjusted the business plan, um, figured out the part of what we'd originally crafted that actually made money, went back to the guy, he ended up funding us, went on our board of advisors, and I sold that company to Citibank seven years later. But the, our very first meeting was one of the most humiliating moments of my entire life, <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> yeah. so the characteristic of an entrepreneur is one to be humiliated a little bit, and like you said, be resilient enough to bounce back. That's right. I, I think it took us two or three weeks to figure out how right the guy was. His name was Ira, and Ira was so right. But it took us two weeks maybe to figure out how right Ira was. And I like to think that I, I can hear that faster now than I used to be able to. But um, <laughs> But I'm not sure. <laughs> you had to go through the stages of grief first to, to get to the point where you could actually hear what he said. Oh, we'd yeah. spent so much time in that presentation of the business plan and the whole thing was stillborn. It was horrible. Uh, but, uh, but we built the company up. That, that company ended up being the first one that we ever sold. And mm -hmm. it provided the seed money for my later ventures. And uh, I'm, I'm eternally appreciative to Ira. Yeah, that's fantastic. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, you've talked about when you do take money, when, why and when do you take money? And then on the flip side, when do you say no and not take the funding? Uh, it's one of the things we teach a whole lot about at the U in my class is some companies need venture funds and investors and other ones mm -hmm. don't. And it, a lot of it has to do with the, the expected trajectory of the company. It's not bad if you don't need venture money. I mean, it, lots of great companies don't. Uh, the last big company that I built and sold didn't take a penny of venture money. Mm -hmm. And venture folks need specific types of returns. And they to, to satisfy their investors, they can only invest in certain types of companies. And if your company doesn't fit that mold, mm -hmm. then don't beat your head against that wall. Um, yeah. But understand what the venture capitalists and the different types of um, funding sources need. Figure out which group of those are the ones that actually are satisfied by what you're trying to build. Um, and it'll make your life and their life a lot easier. So the, when do you start raising? You think about what you're building. Figure out whether you need big chunks of capital so that you can grow fast. And start talking to folks who are going to be your vin um, funding sources well before you need the money yeah because they're gonna look for your ability to actually operate successfully and uh, clear hurdles and achieve milestones and if they've seen you do a couple before because they've been you know chatting with you for six or 12 months they're gonna have a greater degree of trust that you're gonna be able to continue to do that mm -hmm. then you're it's way easier to to get the funding but you better start early even if you don't need the money do you think uh Institutional investors, they want to see the ability to raise kind of friends and family, maybe some en angel money before you start going and seeking uh, capital from uh, institutional investors. And that's pretty much accurate. It's, um, they need to see that your team can operate properly. They're not going to invest in you when it's just a raw deal unless they've seen that you can hire folks, work with them, you know, pivot when necessary and build a, uh, and continue to move forward. And so you need a little bit of money for that. There are some government sources that can help. Um, you can bootstrap it. You can do friends and family. Um, even the angels these days want to see 
some um, history of a uh, track record of success already. Mm -hmm. So you need to identify some ha a handful of early milestones that you can trumpet as uh, success points and show, yes, we can do this. <clears throat> and then raise enough money to make sure that you can get to the next one. Like, order, like if, it, if it's going to take if it's going to take you two hundred thousand dollars, Mike, to get to the next inflection point in the value of the company, raise three hundred. Yeah. To make sure that you've got enough, then you've got a hundred thousand in the bank that'll keep the company going while you're doing the next fundraising round. Right, right. That's good advice. So we get, try to bring in more than you need, so you've got some overlap time. Yeah, because you can't run out. Funny. You mentioned companies <laughs> aren't going to have the trajectory that a uh, venture capital firm might invest in when it comes to that great idea what, what what are some of the things you should go through to really think is my business scalable um beyond uh, just a kind of lifestyle business and, and what, what's the thought process that you take entrepreneurs through when you're thinking about that um well a lot of it you can you can figure out by looking at other businesses that are in the same industry or kind of a, at least a related industry and see how they've grown and use that as a corollary. If you're building a life sciences company, right, and trying to, to develop some sort of solution to a, a healthcare product, I mean, look at the other ones that are in the same space. Most of them have had to raise a lot of money. If you're in contrast doing something that's a services based industry, um, one of my companies was in litigation support, for example. And every time we did a project, we would get paid. And I could use the proceeds from that revenue to fund the next project. I didn't need VC money. It, it grew quite nicely and grew to be quite valuable. Um, but we didn't have to have any VC money. And when we finally did need some cash to do acquisitions, I was able to use bank funding for that, which is much less dilutive, obviously. So, so it's very dependent, obviously, on the model, the business model that you've got too. The value you pay. Yeah, and you can you can learn a whole lot by chatting with your competitors or looking at their their companies and how they've progressed, and figuring out how you're the like those other companies are are different than they are, and um, evaluating what's likely to happen with yours. It's un. It's uncommon that you've got something that's completely novel, that there is no corollary company out there that you can use as an example. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's what, uh, whenever you talk to an entrepreneur and say, do you have any competitors? And they say, not really. I always say, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's not a good thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> you don't so, want to be the only one. It's, it's... So like if, if I am having a hard time figuring that myself, I would turn to trusted advisors like both of y'all's institutions to help me figure that out. Because, I mean, I know a bunch of the folks in, in your shop, Mike, many of whom have fantastic experiences that they could use to explain to me what, how things are likely to pat, move along and can give examples. So using trusted advisors for that kind of analysis is quite useful as well. It's well worth a couple, um, the price of a couple beers to get somebody's time. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's a great point. So you start to build these companies and you put your blood, sweat, and tears into them. Um, when do you determine when it's time to exit and, and how do you know? Um, well, I can speak to how I know. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I might be a little different than some folks because I've done it over and over. I mean, what I like to do is build companies. For mm -hmm. me, it's like Legos and it's fun. Um, other folks build a company and something that becomes their lifetime passion and they get one shot at it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're building a, you know, a plumbing supply company and you, all you know is plumbing, then you're going to keep building it until you don't want to work anymore, right? Because you don't really know what to do otherwise. For me, I, I know it's time to sell when I stop having fun. When it's, um, and for me, I stop having fun when it gets to be too big. And mm -hmm. the, the HR aspects overwhelm the rest of the strategy aspects. Um, for me, it's about 80 or 100 people in the company. Okay. And I like to think of it, if people are walking down the halls and I don't know their names because we've hired people and I don't even know who they are, mm -hmm. it's probably time for me to go. Because mm -hmm. um, I like building them up. I want to know the people. 
And when that stops being the case, um, somebody else with a different set of skills should probably take over that company and move it along. Yeah, that's a great indicator when you when you don't know everybody when you haven't been involved in the hiring process to know everybody's name that's in, in the, that something has to change, right? I mean, you either have to evolve as the leader, or you have to look to bring somebody else in, or it's time to exit. So I think that, that's a great great um, milestone to use to help figure that out. So in the current environment, David. Is this a good time to start a business? What would you recommend to an entrepreneur who was thinking about um, launching their new idea? It's a tough time to start a business right now because it's going to be hard to raise funds. Um, what I've been hearing from the angel community and the institutional VC community is that the, the bar that you have to clear to raise money has been raised and raised significantly. So don't... It, if you're going to start a company that needs external funding, it's going to be a tough time to do so. The flip side of that, it's going to be a great time to buy a company, to buy a small company, because a lot of uh, a lot of small companies are going to get upside down on their balance sheet, and they're going to have a hard time with their P&L, particularly because of the the gap in revenues. So, if you've been thinking about going that direction, now is a really good time to be thinking about that. Interesting. Any any particular uh, industries that you think uh, are more susceptible? I've been looking at fulfillment by Amazon businesses personally, the online retailers, um, particularly the ones that got hit with a double body blow when if they were um, sourcing their product from Wuhan mm -hmm. and it shut down and they were unable to get inventory, and then um, right after that, like a few months after that. The U.S. economy came to a screeching halt. There are some good companies out there that um, they just took it on the chin and need to get recapitalized. I think there'll be opportunities. Excellent, excellent. So that's something to definitely keep an eye out. Um, any last words of advice that you'd pass on? What, what's one or two things that you try to leave your students with uh, after they've taken your class? Um, watch the cash. Just follow the cash um, is the first one. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if you're building a business model that just requires tons and tons of cash to keep that machine moving, then you need to look about, figure out ways to make it more efficient. Um, working capital can just destroy a young company uh, and it's hard to get it. So just be really careful. Is that, that's the first thing I tell them. Um, second thing is, is never fall in love with your product. Right. Okay, because if once you fall in love with it, it's really hard to adjust as you might need to, or even to kill it. Because right. if if you love it and the market doesn't, then you're gonna you're not gonna be successful. So right. figure out there's some fantastic ways to use the web these days to test market stuff that you'd never think you could use the web to test market, and it doesn't cost very much. You throw up you know, a, a, a splash page and do some Facebook ads and see what kind of response rate you get and write down the minimum requirement that you have to have as a response rate, write it on a, a little piece of paper, get your response rate. And if you don't hit that bar, then move on to the next project. Right. Um, well, that's yeah. great. David. This has been uh, very wonderful. Thank you so much. You've shared some very important advice, I think, for entrepreneurs. Uh, Rhea, thank you again for co-hosting. Thank as you, always. Mike. The next guest on Money Matters TV is Ed Sullivan, founder and CEO of Trust Exchange. As a reminder, you can download the podcast from iTunes and Stitcher, and you also can see the program on the YouTube channel Money Matters TV. Thank you for joining us for Growth Stories.